right, welcome. This is Jeff Hagee. Thank you for being with us today. I'm excited today to have Shawnee Harley with me. I want to read a little bit of a bio for her, but then I want to just turn it over. Um, you know, no bio can do her justice. And I want to share some personal insight. But first of all, just to read the bio, Shawnee is a two-time Olympian as a former assistant coach for the Canadian women's basketball team and is one of the most highly certified basketball coaches in Canada. She has 26 years of elite coaching and leadership experience, including the Olympic Games, World Championships, FIBA Americas, and World University Games. Shawnee holds a master's degree in coaching studies, and she is a master coach developer and master learner facilitator for the National Coaching Certification Program, where she trains and mentors both advanced and novice coaches from all sports. In addition, she works with a variety of athletes, parents, and coaches, helping them to excel in sport and life with her mental toughness coaching. So I want to start with that, but I want to just start off actually telling you how I know Shawnee. So when my daughter was young, I've talked about it on a lot of my podcasts and my programs, how she decided when she is young, she wanted to follow the footsteps of one of her childhood heroes and she wanted to play for Alberta basketball she wanted to play university ball and etc and I remember when she had the opportunity to play Alberta basketball and she came home from one of the practices one time and she told me Shawnee was at our practice and you know what the thing that I appreciate Shawnee so much for over the three years that Tia played for Alberta basketball every time that she was at one of Tia's practices, whether she was talking directly to Tia or whatever the case may be, Tia left that practice feeling more confident about herself, feeling better about herself and everything just because of the conversations that Shawnee had with her. So Shawnee, I appreciate that, but fill us in a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what we can share. Well, first of all, that story that made my heart smile. It's like, ooh, (laughs) I could feel that uh, in your story about Tia. And uh, thank you. That it might have meant something to your listeners, but it sure as heck meant it meant a lot to me. So thank you. You you know, Jeff, I I um, I began this journey of mental toughness coaching after I left career coaching as uh, you know, I was coaching at the, in the U S we would call it the college level in Canada. We call it the university level. I I was doing that. I did it for uh, 20 years. And after I left, I was like, okay, what, what are we going to do here? What am I going to do here? And it's, it's really interesting. You know, I, I didn't start out thinking I was going to be a mental toughness coach. Like that wasn't my first thinking when I left career coaching. And I, I, the thing that really poked me was after the Olympics in 2016 in Rio, where I was an assistant coach and being able to be involved in, you know, the inner workings of Olympians, Olympic athletes, Olympic coaches, you know, just a whole Olympic team, what that was like. And we had a huge disappointment in Rio. I mean, it was, it was the darkest days. Oh, wow. I can, had to pause there. I can still feel it. It was uh, some of the darkest days that I had ever experienced in, uh, in sport. And that was, that's what really poked me. It's like, I just experienced the biggest stage the biggest day of my life and I did not show up as my best self. I choked, we choked and it was awful and fascinating at the same time. And I'm like, you know what? I know this happens to athletes all the time, the biggest day, the biggest stage and they flop, they fall flat on their face. And I wanted to dig into why. And I wanted to say, what do, what can I offer from my past experiences so that I can help people rise on the biggest day, the biggest stage of their life? 
Now, <clears throat> just to bring this all into perspective for any of our listeners, um, especially if they're not Canadians, I'm sure they're not following um, the Canadian women's basketball. That was France. Is that correct? That was France. Dang do you, it. Do you want to? Because that, that wasn't supposed to be a loss. <laughs> do you want to just tell a little bit about what happened? Well, I, I think it started off with, in a way, we really surprised ourselves as we went through pool play. Uh, we, we were just, we were playing the best basketball that we had ever played. We were ranked fifth in the world coming in and um, we got all the way to the quarterfinals. Like that's so exciting because you get to the quarterfinals and then you win that game and now you're playing for a medal. Now you might not get a medal, but you're one of four teams. And we were, we were right there and we had, uh, we had played against France a couple of times already in the summer and we had beaten them. We were the favorite, but I, you know, it, it's not like France was a schmuck. Like France was like, say we were ranked fifth in the world. They were ranked sixth or it was super close in the rankings, but we were feeling very prepared and very confident because it's like, wow, we've played them already. We've beaten them. And long story short, uh, we had a big lead and we ended up losing by five and that hurts when you, when you're not expecting to win, you're like, wow, it doesn't hurt as much. But when it's like, you know what, that game was ours. So what's, it's the difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. It's a difference between losing and getting beat, right? Those two things are different. And for me, I can only speak for me, it felt like we lost. We beat ourselves. We, we were the favorites. We had everything we needed to win that game, and we didn't. So, I mean, you're already dealing with elite athletes, the best of the best that have already got to that level. So whether it's an elite athlete or a high school athlete, anything that you're dealing with, what are some of the tools that they need to be able to overcome that so that when they do get on the biggest stage of their life, whether it's the Olympics or whether it's a provincial or state final or even just a regional or zone final, how, how do they make sure that on those biggest days they are going to perform their best? I think one of the things that in some ways kind of worked against us in that scenario, <clears throat> we had done a lot of winning leading up to it. We had, uh, we won the gold medal at the Pan Am games <clears throat> in front of a standing room only crowd. We had won the FIBA Americas. Like we, we had rocked it. Like we had, we were just playing so well. And then I look back on it and it's like, you know what? Winning sometimes is a good deodorant. It covers up the smelly stuff. And so I would say that's one thing for athletes. <clears throat> the day is going to come when you're not going to win. Like that day's coming. You're not going to go defeated, undefeated for your entire life. And athletes that have done a lot of winning it does cover up some of the smelly stuff. What I teach now, I believe that the most, the most important thing, the most important relation, <clears throat> the most important relationship that we can ever have is the relationship with ourself. And I do not believe sport teaches us how to do that. I think sport teaches us to be fake. I think it teaches us to be fluffy and fluffy, meaning I put all my fluff out on social media, all my highlight reels, you know, all those pictures of me where I'm looking amazing. I think sport unintentionally teaches us to lie to ourselves. And what does that mean? I think we do not dig into what's happening in our heart. And in my business, <clears throat> I don't tell people that I do mindset work. I, and, and I'm not opposed to it. I do heart work. 
Why do I do heart work? Because that's where the truth is. And until we face the truth, I don't believe we can ever prepare to step up on the biggest day, the biggest stage of our life. And so when you say, well, what's, what do you mean? What's the truth? What's going on with that? And I'm like, take away the fluff. Give me the freaking substance. And the truth is every single athlete has a fear. And I call it the F word because no one wants to talk about it. Sport doesn't want to talk about it. Just pound your chest. Get out there and be confident. Fake it till you make it. I, I have learned the hard way. I do not agree with any of that. I don't teach it. I'm not a proponent of it. I am a proponent of the truth. And until you face your biggest fear right in the eye, because what's in the way is the way. If you haven't faced your biggest fear, how in the world on the biggest day, the biggest stage of your life, when the outcome is not guaranteed and things aren't going well, or things are going well, and then all of a sudden they're not going well. If you haven't faced your deepest, darkest fears of underperforming, of losing, of looking bad, of making a mistake, how in the world can we be ready for the biggest day, the biggest stage of our life? And so that's why I teach win from within. Okay. So, <clears throat> I mean, uh, talking about that, even talking about the highlights, that's such a great example because I've had athletes that have an incredible highlight reel and they send it off to all the coaches and then they come to me and say, they want to, they want some film of the full game. What should I do? Well, yeah, you've got, they want to see your full game. They don't want, they won't want to just see your highlights. You know, every, everyone can make shots at that level. Everyone can do the things you're doing in the highlights. They want to see everything. And that's hard for some of them to swallow. They, they only want to show them here's, here's my best stuff. Choose me on that. And so absolutely. So when from within is that by that, do you mean facing your fears and being able to win from out from within there? I think winning, I think that's where winning begins. I, and again, I, I, I think sport doesn't help us get good at this because sport only focuses on one thing, the outcome. Did you win? Did you lose? Were the leading scorer or not? Are you a starter or are you on the bench? Did you win the tournament? Did you get recruited? It, it only rewards the outer. But I believe if we're going to conquer the outer, we first have to conquer the inner for heaven's sakes. And to me, the wind from within says, so this will be, this is a, you know, once I get working with athletes, you know, I'll ask them a question like, you know, what's going on with you right now? And they know exactly what that question means. She goes, ah, oh, they'll go like, ah, oh, dang it. She's asking me one of those heart <laughs> questions, not hard, heart. One of those heart questions right now. And, you know, they'll say, well, oh, I'm going to give you an example of a 14-year-old hockey player. And he was, um, I do one-on-ones coaching with him. And he's like, you know what? It just bugs me so much. I'm at these important tryouts and these players are not running the drills properly. They don't pass me the puck when I'm open. You know, they're not working hard for our team to win. And I'm like, oh, I said, okay. I said, so what do you think's really going on? You know, and he's, and, and he knows me so well. He's like, oh, shoot, here we go. Oh, boy. Okay. And then he looks right at me and he goes, oh, I haven't gone deep enough, have I? And I said, you're right. No, you have not gone deep enough. So then we have to go win within. So I said to him, I said to him, why does it bug you when these things are happening? He said, well, then, you know, my team doesn't win. And this is a tryout. And I said, okay. So what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? So when we are in these, there's this, this fear, and I really believe we all have it. 
And if we don't have it, it's it's coming. Like it's there. I call it the fear that follows and finds you. And he said, he said, well, if we don't win, how am I going to get picked for the team? And, and I said, keep going. I said, you're getting warmer. And I said, what are you afraid of? He's, so then he goes, I could see the light bulb. He goes, oh, boom. He goes, oh, I know what I'm in. He said, I'm in FOPO, F-O-P-O. I said, you're right. Fear of people's opinions. So long story short, what he figured out is I'm not mad that these players aren't running the drills, that they're not passing me the puck. He said, what I'm afraid of is that they are affecting my play and that's going to have an effect on what the coaches think. So we call this FOPO fear of people's opinions is the fear of disapproval. And so he said, oh, I get it. He said, it's, I'm not mad. He said, I'm afraid. I said, yes. And I said, tell me again what you're afraid of. He said, I'm afraid that I'm not looking good enough on the ice because of my other teammates and I'm not going to get chosen for the team. The coach isn't going to pick me. I said, now I can help you. Now I can help you because we're talking about the real problem. We're not talking about this fluffy thing up here while people are passing me the puck. They're not running the drill properly. And I'm like, yeah, that's not it. So that's why we have to go deeper. We have to go. We don't have to. This is just what I teach. <laughs> I really get my clients to go within because the answer is always in our heart, not in our head. So... <clears throat> I, you know, and that I love that the FOPO because I would think as people dig down and get, get deeper in their own situations, that's a lot of fear for the athletes. Not not just some of them, but a lot of them have that same fear. And so, what are some of the things that your athletes focus on to overcome that? Such a great question. First of all, I don't think it's possible to make it completely go away. And I don't teach that. I just okay. like, give me a scale of one to 10. And they'll be like, yeah, I'm worried about what other people, a nine. I'm like, okay. We will always care what people think. That is completely normal. It's completely normal. But what I teach them is it's the difference between the want and the need. I want you to approve of me, but I don't need you to. Because when I need you to, now I'm needy. And needy always shows up as weak and disempowered. Always, 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 always. So what I work on is it's perfectly fine to worry about what your coach is thinking. Because your coach has a lot of power. <laughs> a lot of power over you. I get it. But I, so I ask them, so if there's 100% of the opinion available, when you give your coach 100% of it, how much is left for you? Well, obviously the answer is zero. And I'm like, so how does that feel when you have zero of the opinion? And they're like, it's awful. I'm like, I know. Because when we worry too much about what others think, we will always be their prisoner. Athletes are prisoners to their coaches often. I won't, don't want to say always, but often. And so the only way we can release ourselves from jail to stop being the prisoner is I ask them, what do you think? What, about, what do you think about your performance? What do you think about you? Remember I started this whole conversation? The most important relationship we will ever have is the relationship with ourselves. So I teach them how to have a relationship with themselves, have an opinion and have an opinion that might be contrary to what your coach thinks. That does not make you uncoachable. It just means what I think matters. I need to have a voice because this is my life. And I tell athletes, drive the bus, stop being a passenger, drive the bus. So I work on this, this, 
how much should, of the opinion should you have and how much should your coach have? And I give them and I make them give me a number. For some of them, they're like, well, 60, 40. I'm like, great. I'm like, who gets the 60? And they're like, oh, it's supposed to be me, right? I'm like, yeah, it's supposed to be you. And I said, how much of the opinion are you giving to social media? I said, guess how much of the opinion you should give to social media? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. How much to the people in the stands that half of them don't even know what they're talking about? How much of your opinion? Zero. How much to your teammates? And I'm like, remember, your teammates don't know any more than you do. And they're like, well, maybe I'd give like 10% to my, I'm like, okay. I said, I don't care what the percentage is, but you have to enter. You have to enter the equation. One more thing that I teach them is the difference between goals and values and which of those do, are you driven by your goals or your values? And what that means for me is if I only care what that my coach thinks of me, I'm driven by my goals. Am I, am I a good enough shooter? Am I a good enough ball handler? Am I going to be the leading? Like the outcomes. I'm driven by my goals. And I teach athletes, you should be, the goals are what we aspire to, but our values are what drive us. And goals are what we do. Values are who we are. And I think that's why athletes lose themselves in FOPO. Mm -hmm. Cause they're like, if I just score enough points, if I make the all-star team, if I get the scholarship, if I'm the quickest, fastest, strongest, smartest, everyone's going to like me. Everyone's going to approve of me. And we know that becomes a dead end. So we, they lose themselves in the pursuit of this shiny thing. And I've seen it time and time again. Athletes don't get what they want and they are devastated. Devastated is different than disappointed. Devastated, they often don't bounce back. They quit the sport or their self-esteem is so low they never, they, it takes them a very, very, very long time to get back to where they were before the, the devastation. I see it all the time in sport. So two things that I work on is have an opinion, drive the bus, get clarity on your values and lead with your values. And sometimes even leading with your values, you're not going to still get the shiny thing. Such as, oh, well, such is life. Such a sport. Who said that this is a guarantee? Sport is a gamble. Every single day, sport is a gamble. The outcome is not guaranteed. And athletes don't know how to handle that. And they get fed. They drink the wrong Kool-Aid, in my opinion. If you, you just work, just work hard enough, you can have anything you want. I totally disagree. Okay, I'm going to pause there because I can tell I'm on a rant. I need to, I need to, I need to take a breath. <laughs> no, I love it. There's so much truth to that because, you know, I had um, Tyson Durfee. He's a world champion calf roper on, on one of my episodes. And we were talking that and he said, you know, I put in so many hours of practice. It helped build my confidence because I felt that I deserved to win, but it didn't guarantee me to win. It didn't mean just because I felt that and just because I had done the work that I was going to win. And that's exactly what you're saying there. And I think that's what a lot of times we see is athletes going in saying, well, I'm ranked better. I'm better. So I've got this win. And then that's like you say, you, you face that devastation and, and it can, you know, the, the worst I, I hate to see when an athlete's devastated with a loss and like you say, then they quit the sport and you know, it is, it's sad to see those things. Now, let me think of uh, where I want to lead this with looking at, I guess, both long-term and short-term. And I'll explain what I mean by that. 
how do you teach your athletes to deal with failure? And by that, what I mean is, okay, how, how did you teach your, how did you work with your Olympic team when they lost, but also on more of a micro level, how do you deal with failure in a game? you miss a shot and you know, we, we see both sides of it. We miss a shot. They're unconscious. They don't even think about it again. Then you have the other player that misses a shot and they're useless for the next five plays because they're still thinking about that shot. So how do you, how do you deal with failure that way? You know, it's another one of those F words, isn't it? And the way that I deal with it is who, why did we believe Why do we believe that failure is bad? I mean, to me, I'm like, if you're not failing, you are not growing. If you don't want to fail, play it safe. Keep doing the things you're already good at. Don't take any risks and definitely never try something new. There, boom. Now you won't have to fail very often. But we know there's a cost yeah. for playing it safe, right? We never, we never become the best version of ourselves. And so I teach athletes when you're failing, when you're making mistakes, when you're uncomfortable, when you're taking risks, when it, you get that yucky feeling in your stomach, when you know you're getting ready to, it's like, oh my goodness. I'm like, give yourself a gold star. Because that's proof and evidence that you are growing. So do you want to grow or do you want to hide? If you want to grow, failure is part of the formula. And so what I do with athletes is I normalize it. It is completely normal. Again, going back to this hockey player, he's like, yeah, we had a shootout. And coach said, who wants to take the shootout? Who wants to take one? And he's like, I didn't raise my hand. I'm like, why not? He goes, well, I didn't want to miss. I'm like, great. Way to avoid failure. That's great. Never raise your hand for an important moment to take, you know, to take a shootout. How do you think that's going to work from you for you four years from now when you want to play in the AJHL? I said, you can keep your hand down if you want but there will be a cost. Failure is normal. And I also said to him, I said, have you ever seen a professional NHL player miss the net in a shootout? He's like, oh yeah, lots. I'm like, I know. So failure is perfectly fine. It is perfectly normal. Then he, then this is the other piece that comes. They're like, well, if, if I had more confidence, then I would take more risks. I'm like, oh, boy, that's, that's, that's never going to – I'm like, okay, then what happens if you never get confident? Oh, I guess I'll never take risks. I know. So I – again, how do I deal with fear? I tell them we are not going to wait for confidence to help you overcome your fear. In my opinion, confidence is an emotion based on results. It is not a personality trait. It's an emotion based on results. When you're good at something, do you have to try and be confident? No. When you're bad at something, you shouldn't feel confident. Hello? (laughs) Confidence and competence are connected. So if you want to be confident, get good at something or better at it. And in the meantime, practice courage. Practice courage because courage is an action. Fear, confidence is an emotion. Those two things can coexist. So I tell my athletes, How are we going to deal with fear? We're going to look at right in the eye and be like, yep, there it is. There it is. The fear that follows and finds me. Last, last possession. 
who's winning. Somebody's going to take the winning shot. Who's it going to be? And I teach, I, I got this from Brene Brown and the concept is brave and afraid. I can feel afraid because that's an emotion and I can still be brave because that's an action. I can take the winning shot even though I feel afraid or nervous or worried that I won't make it. So that's the other way that I deal with fear. We never, we're not going to make fear go away. We want to just dial it down so it's manageable. And then we want to choose courage because I think courage is a choice. We can decide to be courageous. And I also believe that decisions decide destiny. And in my courses, the number one, I tell them the number one most important mental toughness tool that I'm going to teach you is courage. I love that. That's, that's wonderful. So <clears throat> this is really interesting. I love this. And I, I really, I mean, and we'll talk about it in a minute, some of your programs and stuff, because more and more people, whether you're an athlete or in the corporate world, we need these things. So we'll talk about some of your programs, but I want to take a step back um, just because you've had some of the most amazing experiences too. And so I, I want to hear a little bit about that. And so tell me, I mean, you've been to the Olympics, you've been to the world championships, all those things. What has been your most exciting experience? <clears throat> I'll tell you the, the word that popped in my mind is what was my most meaningful. Okay. Meaningful. Ex ex but mean, when it's meaningful, it also is exciting, but um, meaningful for me is what, what was an experience that hit me right in my heart? I will never forget <clears throat> our first game at the Olympics. And you know, warm-ups are going on and then everybody has to line up and they're introducing the players and then they're going to play the national anthem. So we're all standing and I'm, I'm facing the flag and our national anthem starts to play and I start crying. I, holy cow, man, I can feel it right now. <clears throat> I can still feel that I start crying because I'm looking at the flag. I'm standing at the Olympics in Rio waiting for our first game to start. And I remembered thinking, I thought about my family. I thought about, look at where I come from. Like I'm a small town girl. I grew up in Campbell River, BC. I went to a small 1A school. We had like 65 people in my grad class. And I remember thinking, I did it. Like, I, I'm here. I, I made it. All of this hard work, all of this commitment. And I remember it was like, it just hit me. And it was the most wonderful feeling in the world, the emotion that it brought. And I remembered thinking how proud I was to be able to stand there on that day and represent myself, my family, friends, community, and represent my country. That I will never, ever, ever forget that. That's an amazing story and not one that many people will have the opportunity and you know one of the things you said at the end there you know representing yourself your friends your family your country that's one thing that I mean going back to the very first thing I talked about with you and Tia your presence and that but something else when she played and they would when they would have their practices up in Edmonton they were practicing at the same place that Team Canada was practicing at. And they had the opportunity to meet those, those girls and spend time with them and stuff. 
I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, I wrote an article about, I called it surround yourself with greatness. Just talk about the impact of the people you surround yourself with. I, I think that those are need to be very intentional decisions. I believe that we become like who we hang around with. And it's another thing that I work on with the athletes. I, uh, I just, I will ask them who's in their peer group because you look at it like if you are a super dedicated work, hardworking, you know, focused, and you start hanging around with people that aren't, they, it, it influences. Yeah. So I've, I'm just very intentional <clears throat> with who I, who I hang around with. And what I call that is my inner circle. And my inner circle is very exclusive. I don't let everyone into my inner circle. I want people in my inner circle that <clears throat> are like me. But I also want people in my inner circle that aren't like me. Right? Because if there's too much sameness, yeah. that's not going to push me. So there are some people in my inner circle that um, we would share common values, but we have so many differences and they poke me and push me all the time. They challenge me. I want people in my inner circle that disagree with me. I want people in my inner circle that hold me accountable to showing up as the best version of myself. So those are the kind of people that, that I surround myself with. Cause it's like, man, I, I want, I want to stand on the podium. I'm not coaching with team Canada anymore, so, but I want to stand in the gold medal position on the podium of life. So I want to find other people that want that same podium that are going to push pull, prod, challenge. And I think that those, that last piece I said, we tend, right, because we're wired for safety, we're wired for comfort. And yet, if we only surround ourselves by people that always agree with us, how do we get uncomfortable? So that's what my inner circle is. It's very, it's tight, and sometimes those people in my inner circle bug me <laughs> in, in all the best ways. And I'm like, and that's why you get to stay in that inner circle. <clears throat> so my, my point being, we become, I think we become like who we spend time with. And so being intentional about where we give our energy to and who we allow to give our energy to us. I think being intentional is very important. I think, I think that, I mean, it's a, an important message for everyone, but especially like the young athletes I work with to understand that be intentional, intentional about the people that you're surrounding yourself with, because I mean, it's even, you know, you look at, you know, your parents want your kids to have good friends. Well, why? Because you're going to become like your friends. And so being intentional is uh, such a huge part of that. So thank you for sharing that. Well, you've got some amazing things from your trainings to your calls to your newsletter. Share with our audience where they find you, what you offer and all of those sort of things. And tell us about fear to fear. To fierce. Mm hmm Firstly, you can, the best way to find me is on my website and it's my first and last name. It's Shawnee Harley, S-H-A-W-N-E-E-H-A-R-L-E.com. I'm on social media. I'm pretty average. I'm not going to lie. Pretty average in the social media space. <laughs> Some people would say below average and it would be tough for me to disagree with that. Um, my website is the best spot and I'm launching my new program called fear to fierce. And I chose that title intentionally based on the conversation that we've had. What is holding you back as an athlete 
from becoming your best self. It will always be something that's in your heart that you probably haven't talked about to anyone. You might, you probably don't even know it's there because sport tells us, don't be, don't be afraid. And it's a three month program where we move from fear. We shift from fear to fierce because it's a skill. It's a skill. That means I help them build a toolkit to manage these fears, to manage the mistakes, the failures, the disappointments, the nerves, the anxiety. What do we do about that? How do we manage that? Because could you imagine on the biggest day, the biggest stage of your life, if you showed up fierce? Like, like I can feel that, right? I mean, like, man, I would just freaking kick some butt and take no prisoners. Like that feeling, right? We know what that feeling is. So it's a, I'm running a three month program and we, we go, we do two zoom sessions a month and we run, I run a five, a private Facebook group where we go in and we talk about these things and people get a one-on-one coaching from me, this hockey player that I was telling you about, those are the conversations that we're having in there's an athletes Facebook group that parents are not allowed in. And then there's a parents Facebook group and obviously athletes are not allowed in there. And we, we get in there and we talk, we speak the truth. We talk about the truth. I coach them about the truth and what to do with it. And then the third part of the program is, Anybody that registers, they get access to my online course called Mental Toughness, How Champions Are Built. And we go through that course together and I coach them. It's That's where the toolkit is. So we do this for three months and it's so exciting for me. Like there are nights when I'm laying in bed and I can't even get to sleep and I'm like, Shawnee. Like, this is how you were when you were at, you know, at the Olympics. Like, my mind is just so excited and so engaged about engaged about it and with it. And I've already started. There's a September entry, and I had a, a group of early birds. I gave a bonus for an early bird sign-up. So we've already had almost a month in there. And that's why I can't sleep at night. It's so exciting. Um, I tell people... Um, this, this fear to fierce is going to change your life forever. And I truly believe that. It's outstanding. And I'll make sure I'll put all the links in the show notes and stuff. So if anyone heard that and they're trying to write it down quick, all the links will be there so that you can just go click on it as well. Shawnee, thank you so much. This has been outstanding to listen to you talk about these things and share your experiences and knowledge and everything. Really appreciate that. I think we're going to have to do it again. I would absolutely love it. Absolutely. And next time, let's next, let's do it live next time. Come down here to Arizona and we'll do it that way. (laughs) Hey, you know, you know, the last time I saw you, Kobe Bryant was in the same building with us. In Phoenix or in, yeah. Yeah, in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Yes. In fact, wow. yeah, I'm trying to recall. I think I saw a picture of you and him from that weekend. Was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, we were, that was that tournament. Uh, that was that tournament in, uh, I think that was in Gilbert, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. Kobe. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate this. This has been awesome. Thanks, Jeff. I know our paths are going to cross again.